happy to announce Arthur Jans, uh, who's going to give another uh, talk in, in the web track, I think we can say, about rootkits in web applications, where he's going to tell us about cross-site scripting, I believe. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, so, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'll just do a short introduction. Uh, my name is Arthur Jans and I work at Google and Google is doing a lot of really serious security research and some not really all that serious research, some sort of wacky stuff. And if you're sort of wondering what the wacky stuff might be, uh, I guess you'll get to see. Um, so uh, I was uh, thinking of this talk as a sort of short, light-hearted uh, overview of some of the issues that are relevant to uh, exploiting web vulnerabilities on web clients. Um, so, so the first thing to get out of the way uh, is, I know that the talk has uh, rootkits uh, in its title, but it's actually not about rootkits at all. Um, so if you're, uh, you know, if you're used to the idea of, of rootkits as this thing on the client side that lets you hide uh, processes and, and, do, uh, and enable malware to avoid detection, uh, it, it's not going to be about that. Um, but it'll be about something that's, that you know, apparently is a little different, but, but there are many similarities. So uh, what I'm talking about is attacks on web application clients that are due to uh, various kinds of script injection. And obviously the uh, most uh, often uh, discovered uh, attack is, is cross-site scripting. Uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a quick introduction to uh, those attacks and, and how they work um, uh, very quick. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the interesting stuff, uh, hopefully for you, uh, which is what happens after a, a script injection attack actually is successful. So after we have a cross-site scripting victim, uh, what can be done and what are the, the problems for web application authors uh, related to that? And obviously, uh, for it to be a complete uh, you know, security conference presentation, we have to introduce a new buzzword. Uh, there's, n there's no uh, other way. Um, so the buzzword for today is resident XSS. Uh, and you know, it, it's, uh, it's sort of tongue in cheek, right? I don't think anyone should, should go off and start using it after I describe it. But it, it's something that will help us uh, sort of be on the same page about the particular kind of attack. And and then I'll talk a little bit about how, uh, uh, what the difficulties are uh, with cleaning up uh, users who have uh, suffered from, from this attack. Um, so uh, I mentioned before that this talk isn't really about rootkits because for in, in traditional software and client-side software, um, the way you uh, sort of have malware uh, running on, on users' machines is that first you find a code execution vector, um, you know, so you find a bug, uh, you, or you, uh, you uh, entice a user to, to click on your executable and, and fool them that way. Uh, if, if you actually find a vulnerability, you have to bypass you know, ASLR and DEP and stuff like that. Uh, and after you get to that point, you do the things, uh, as malware, you do the things that, that I classified loosely as a rootkit, and you know, we, we can talk about semantics later if anyone wants to. Um, so uh, stuff like inserting a backdoor to maintain uh, uh, access to the machine for an attacker and hiding the presence of attacker's processes uh, on the machine, uh, l let's call that rootkit functionality. And after you have that, after you have the way to execute code, uh, and uh, a way to hide your presence and maintain access, then you can do uh, various kinds of evil things, and we've all seen malware and, and what it does. So this is sort of the traditional way um, uh, malware has worked. Um, and it, didn't, it never really applied to web apps, right? Because web apps are, are sort of different. Um, but uh, and the sort of idea that I want to impart on you is that web applications have evolved in, in the last you know, five or 10 years to the point where we can have similar things uh, to rootkits uh, running uh, within uh, web applications for a particular user. So, uh, and and I'll, I'll, talk, uh, I'll talk more about that. 
Um, so uh, unless you've been living under a rock for the last nine or ten years, you know what XSS is, uh, but I'll just go over it very quickly. Uh, XSS is cross-site scripting. It's when a web application allows uh, external users to uh, submit queries that will uh, execute some code uh, supplied by the attacker in a victim's browser. So for example, uh, if uh, the victim.net domain is not careful about sanitizing uh, uh, or escaping, uh, actually, the user input, the script in the, uh, supplied in the URL parameter will be treated as markup in the user's browser, and it will execute in the context of the victim domain. Um, so the reason for that is that the web application doesn't escape the HTML meta characters, uh, and uh, which leads to the vulnerability. Attacker scripts get to run. There's no way for the browser to distinguish attacker-supplied scripts, in this case, from a legitimate scripts on that website. Uh, so uh, whatever code the attacker uh, gives to the victim uh, of this attack will be uh, run in the scope of the victim user's authenticated session. Uh, and uh, the attacker will be able to execute uh, to, to, uh, XML HTTP requests back to the same server and basically impersonate the user. It, it's, it's code execution, sort of, uh, for the web. Um, and whenever uh, people uh, see uh, information about XSS for the first time, uh, they, they see two, uh, two things that, that are my sort of pet peeve, um, because th that's not really how it works. Um, so the, the first thing you learn about XSS is that you, you find a vulnerability, you send a link to some user, and they click on it, and, and then you, know, you can run your code. Um, uh, but that, that isn't really how it works, because you would have to have your entire payload in the URL. Uh, it doesn't, there are many other cross-site scripting attacks that, that wouldn't work uh, this way. Uh, the user would see some kind of weird URL with scripts. You know, the, if you send it to them via email, the, uh, the link might be uh, broken up on, uh, onto several lines. It just basically, it, it wouldn't really work. And the second thing is the way you exploit uh, cross-site scripting it isn't to uh, just send the cookie, uh, the authentication cookie, back to the attacker. Because the, the, one of the first things that, that we learn about cross-site scripting is that it has access to all the cookies uh, within the victim's browser. So you can just get the browser to send the attacker the session cookie, and the attacker can, from their own machine, uh, send all the requests that are necessary to, to impersonate the user. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you know why isn't it, how, how this works, what's the problem with, with the second thing? Sure. Browsers don't allow this. They scan for document cookie in URLs and then they block it. Uh, so browsers don't really allow this. Uh, and the reason for this is that document cookie uh, uh, so, so there's this attribute set on cookies uh, called HTTP only, which all web apps that know what they're doing are setting on authentication cookies, and which means that JavaScript doesn't have access to authentication cookies. So you can't really steal a cookie this way. There are some vulnerabilities that, that might let you do that, but really that's not how, how you would exploit it. Um, so how you could exploit cross-site scripting is to, to get a user to, to visit this page with, with a cute kitten. Um, so obviously there is nothing to, to let us know that there, the, that there might be a cross-site scripting exploit there, but there could be invisible frames uh, that do the same thing, basically create a, an iframe or, or some other or, or a frame to uh, the, the victim page uh, that the user never sees. Um, another way to, uh, to exploit XSS is to just visit um, uh, you know, any, any popular uh, internet site. Um, so my, my claim is that if you visit this page, you might actually fall victim to cross-site scripting on, uh, in some web application that you're currently logged into. Um, does anyone have any ideas uh, why that might be? Oh. 
ads. Exactly, yes. So if, if you're an attacker, you can just pay an ad network uh, to distribute your uh, flash file or uh, you know, snippet of, of HTML to be loaded in a frame, uh, and it will be shown on, on various popular uh, websites. Um, so uh, there, have, there has actually been research uh, on uh, showing uh, malicious ads to users, or uh, uh, researchers have used this technique to uh, and sort of demonstrate evil, uh, distributing evil payloads to users. So, so this is another way that, that you could execute XSS. Um, so what would happen is that uh, you as a user, you visit an attacker's page, uh, there's a hidden frame somewhere there with the cross-site scripting payload, and the exploit uh, runs in the context of, of the target domain and does something malicious. Uh, so the malicious things could be, uh, it could initiate a bank transfer. If you're logged into your banking application, it could uh, transfer money to the attacker. Uh, it could set up an email filter for your webmail service uh, that would uh, forward all your incoming emails to the attacker, uh, and it could do uh, a bunch of evil things. Um, another way is, uh, is if there is a persistent cross-site scripting bug, uh, which is a way for other users to uh, embed code on a page that you normally see in the web application. Uh, once you fall victim to that, you can. Th there have been many cases of cross-site scripting worms uh, because of persistent cross-site scripting. But in both cases, and we don't need to get into details of, uh, about that. Um, but in both cases, uh, the exploit is, is doing something malicious. But there is a problem from the attacker's point of view. Uh, uh, a problem with exploiting this. So. Once you find a bug and you start exploiting it, and you have to take, uh, so there are two things you have to do. First of all, you know that if you are, uh, if a user visits your page with a picture of a cute kitten, uh, they won't be on that page for very long. Uh, and you can, there are some ways in which you can try and to get them to stay on that page, but, but in general, uh, uh, what you would do as an attacker is you would execute your evil code right away as soon as possible. Um, so you, know, you, you just set up your evil uh, email filter or, or make the bank transfer and, and that's it. Um, and the second problem, uh, and the problem associated with that is that the vulnerable web application uh, immediately sees uh, when users start getting exploited uh, via this technique uh, that you know, there might be uh, maybe a thousand users or 10,000 users if we're talking about mass exploitation uh, that uh, executed some action within a very short period of time. So the web application will know immediately um, that there is something going on, that there, uh, there's usually monitoring. So as an attacker, you, you have to expect that, that someone will be on to you in you know, maybe minutes Maybe maybe a few hours, um, and that way you you burn your uh, your exploit and and you can't use it again because it, uh, supposedly it'll be fixed. Um, so uh, I, I talked about cross-site scripting a little bit, but it's not really the only way in which you can uh, inject evil scripts onto uh, important domains uh, uh, of applications that uh, that internet users uh, use. Um, so cross-site scripting is one of them. Uh, there's also universal cross-site scripting, which is uh, uh, when a browser or, or browser plugin uh, has a bug that, that affects all web pages. So it's not necessarily that you as the web application author have, have done something wrong. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's possible that there is a, a bug in, in a plugin that the user has installed on their machine. And uh, to quote uh, Dan from, from yesterday, it's always freaking Java. Uh, and it, it really is because uh, very recently there have been examples of, of universal cross-site scripting uh, in, in the Java plugin that's still very widely installed. Um, then there are uh, ways to get the user to uh, put something, uh, put a bit of JavaScript in their URL bar, and when you hit enter, it actually executes the code that you put in there. So Facebook has suffered uh, from this attack quite a bit because people were uh, unknowingly pasting uh, snippets of JavaScript into their URL bar, and when you execute it, it, it actually runs in the context of, of Facebook without any fault of the web application provider. They, they didn't do anything wrong, but the users didn't really know what they were doing. It's the same way 
uh, malware gets distributed when you send someone an evil attachment when people just don't know any better. Uh, and, and there are some more uh, sophisticated attack, uh, attacks related to, the, to abusing the URL bar. Um, and then there are, there are yet other ways of, of injecting your evil scripts Onto, onto target uh, victim domains. So for example, if the, if the web application uh, is uh, trusting uh, external uh, providers for their JavaScript, for example, for example the OMG awesome JavaScript bunnies.com, totally trustworthy uh, page, right? I mean, there's, wh why would we ever worry about their security? Um, but you know, may maybe they're, they're, they're not all that awesome, uh, even though they might be bunnies. Um, so uh, you know they can be compromised, and suddenly the resource that your web application is loading is, is backdoored in some way and can execute uh, 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 some evil code of the attacker's choosing. Uh, and it can also happen to your domain. So uh, if you have a, a big domain that hosts many applications, it might also host static files that are uh, uploaded uh, by, say, uh, marketing people that, that have no idea. Is anyone here from a marketing person? <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, so you have clueless marketing people that uh, you know might uh, might uh, have access to a particular uh, directory on your domain. Uh, and what if you know they, they use the same password on uh, you know all their uh, web accounts, and it, the password gets compromised somewhat? Someone logs into uh, their account, uh, uploads a file that's also uh, that's an HTML file, can execute scripts. I mean, th th there are all uh, there are a bunch of attacks like that 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 allow you to inject uh, evil scripts in onto some domain. And another uh, sort of good vector that that many people don't think about is cache poisoning. Um, so, uh, a quick question: Who is using the wireless network here? So about half of the people are using the wireless network, and about and the other half are too lazy to raise their hands, right? Um, <laughs> so yeah, everyone is using the wireless network here. Um, so when you connect to an untrusted wireless network, uh, you, you're at the mercy of the provider and other people who might uh, be able to control that network, especially especially wireless, but but not only. So what can happen is that you, after browsing the internet. Uh, from a network like that, you will continue to use a, a browser with, with evil cache, so cached resources that were uh, uh, injected there by the evil network by doing, say, DNS spoofing or just man in the middle on HTTP traffic. Uh, and those resources can be very long lived. So if you, uh, you can have, uh, for, for example, a, a JavaScript snippet that is used on, in many uh, applications, such as uh, maybe SWF object or one of those popular JavaScript libraries. Uh, uh, when you visit, uh, when, uh, when you browse the web from an untrusted network, um, you, it will be backdoored, which, uh, and by that I mean it might still contain the same functionality that you're expecting, it'll just have an evil script that can be activated in some way by the attacker. Um, and you know, it, it can live in your browser cache for a year or two. Um, so that's another way. Um, and the, the last category of things is uh, even for web applications that do HTTPS properly, uh, there, are, there are some things that... So if you have a sensitive web application that, that's only using HTTPS, uh, so it's less vulnerable to the cache poisoning, uh, there, are, there are a bunch of bugs that, that can allow attackers to inject those scripts. So there are uh, mixed content bugs where a web application loads resources over HTTP uh, if the page is HTTPS, which bypasses the HTTPS uh, protections completely. And then we, ha uh, we can have stolen or for certificates and we can have evil CAs uh, issuing evil certificates and uh, all, there's always a chance to get the user to, to click through a warning and, and then they would connect to an attacker's web server that would cache some uh, resource uh, uh, under the context of HTTPS of the victim domain. Um, 
So, uh, so I'm, I'm going to focus on cross-site scripting, but, but please uh, take into account that when I say cross-site scripting, uh, it, it actually, uh, all, all of these uh, possible vectors are, could, could be used instead of cross-site scripting. And one, thing, one other thing to, uh, to remember is that after an evil script runs uh, in, in the context of the vulnerable web application, uh, we can assume that the attacker can keep up the communication uh, with, uh, with the victim's browser. And I'll talk a little more about that. Um, so we talked uh, about uh, ways to, uh, to inject scripts, uh, but now I'll talk about why, what bad things uh, attacker-supplied scripts uh, can do in web applications. Um, so now it's time for me to, to introduce the, the, the buzzword of the day, resident XSS. So resident XSS, by my definition, is uh, when malicious code is injected into the user's uh, main web application window or tab. So uh, contrast that with, uh, with the techniques I, I mentioned earlier, uh, where uh, there is a hidden frame uh, on some website that, that might uh, execute the attack. Um, Resident XSS is when the attack, uh, the, the evil code, isn't contained to some hidden frame on some website. Uh, it's when the, the main window that you're interacting with for your, say, social network or, or uh, webmail uh, client or, or, or anything like that, when this window is actually uh, executing the, the code that, uh, that the attacker chose. Um, so, let me just quickly tell you how that might happen. Um, so if there's persistent cross-site scripting when you, uh, the, when you use the web application, for example, if there's an email message that someone sent to you uh, that doesn't get escaped properly, you open your webmail application, uh, the code runs, and it, it runs right in, in your, uh, your main web app window. Uh, and it could be other things, status updates and uh, comments on a forum, and they, they, they would all work that way. It's actually a, a relatively rare vulnerability these days um, compared to all the other kinds of cross-site scripting that, that are still prevalent on the web. Um, another way is... Uh, Many new uh, web applications use uh, client-side storage mechanisms you, uh, introduced in HTML5. Um, so local storage or uh, uh, web SQL, web database uh, uh, functionality, which lets them store uh, large amounts of data in the browser. But the problem is that when there is a cross-site scripting bug, uh, the attacker can quickly uh, backdoor the data in the victim's browser and when when the for example when the cached javascript uh, uh, file gets loaded next time the user logs into the application it will also contain the attacker supplied code and there, there was a great paper investigating that uh, by Don Song and, and the students at, at her lab at, at UC Berkeley. Uh, I think it's called the Emperor's New API, so it, it's definitely worth a read. And they found that uh, a lot of the uh, new uh, sort of cool web applications are, are using those techniques and are indeed vulnerable. Um, and then there are other ways. For example, if, if you have a regular cross-site scripting bug, it can open a new window uh, to, the, uh, to the main application. Uh, so for example, if you, uh, if you fall victim to, to that attack, you, uh, you would see two webmail windows right next to one another, and one of them is the one that you opened, and the second one is, uh, is one that was opened by, uh, by an evil hidden frame somewhere, and that frame managed to open that window and inject uh, attacker's code into that. So that, that's another technique. Uh, and th th there are a bunch of other ways. So uh, th th my main point here is that uh, any script injection vulnerability uh, can be wi with a high degree of success converted into a, a resident XSS. So I've, I've talked quite a bit about all of that, but now let's get to, to the actually interesting part of, of the talk, which is once you run resident XSS in, in someone's browser, all the assumptions they have about interacting with, with the web application are, are violated. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So first of all, 
once you have this uh, web application that runs attacker's JavaScript, um, you uh, say you want to log out because maybe there's something strange. You think maybe there was an attack on your browser or, or there, there's, you just want to close it. Um, so the first thing you do is you, you click log off, but well, the, the web application is now running the injected JavaScript, so the attacker can hijack the log out button uh, and so that when you click it, it actually, uh, so in, in the sort of basic case, it might not do anything. So you, you can't really log off. And uh, the attacker could also uh, do more sneaky things. For example, when you click on log out, it could create a, a small window in the background uh, that uh, to bypass pop-up blockers, then close the, the web application window, but keep its own session running in the window in the background. Uh, and uh, so basically, uh, and another thing that it could do is say for your banking application, uh, which times out after uh, uh, you know, a, a few minutes or, or, or half an hour or something like that, uh, the attacker, when you click log off, the attacker could show you the logout page so I'm saying, thank you, uh, you, know, you have logged out, uh, everything is peachy, uh, and then uh, continue issuing uh, keep alive requests to the uh, banking application server so that you think you're logged out, you got the page that says you're logged out, but it, it actually keeps polling the server to, and keeps the session alive until you close that, uh, that tab. Uh, but when that happens, the attacker has, has yet other ways to, to keep the, the infected session going. Um, another thing is you can't really leave that uh, web application that, that's been infected. So if you, uh, if you have a link and you want to follow it uh, and you expect the, the link to take you to another page, um, the attacker can just open it in another window. Uh, you can you know, uh, basically any kind of navigation that you expect the web, the web application to do uh, can be subverted. Um, but, but those are just things to, to keep you uh, in uh, the attacker's hands. Um, but the interesting things is what the attacker can, can do once you're, once you're interacting with the web application. So, for example, off-the-record chats or, uh, or any keystrokes that are typed into that application are, can be monitored by the attacker because he is running his, his evil scripts there. Uh, mouse movements or um, any other thing, basically, is, can be monitored that, that you're doing. Even if uh, uh, there is no functionality to uh, sort of save it to the web application just because it's in the, uh, in the browser's DOM when you're interacting with it, uh, the attacker can get to it. And the attacker can also modify anything. So you can see uh, messages in your webmail uh, that, that come from the attacker that are indistinguishable uh, from valid messages. Uh, and there's no trace of that at all. So for example, if you, know, you get scammed, you, uh, you get the police to issue a subpoena uh, against the, uh, the web application, uh, the uh, webmail provider to try and track down the, the scammers, they won't see anything in their logs because it's not really a, a it's not a real mail message that you got. It, it's a spoofed one. Um, uh, and, and, and there are a bunch of other things. So once you're in that application, the attacker can show a fake login page to pretend that you're logged out. You will type in your, your password, maybe your uh, you know, uh, one-time password or, or SMS code, uh, and the attacker can, can get that data. Um, and then after you do that, the, uh, the overlay can just disappear and, and you see you're logged into the web application again. Uh, and you just don't suspect anything because why would you? Uh, it can fish for security questions. So uh, and that, that's even sneakier because it lets you attack other web applications uh, uh, using the knowledge that you get from, uh, from hijacking just one of the web applications that uh, uh, that the user is using. And then there are things like geolocation APIs or uh, a microphone or a camera that you might have uh, granted access to, uh, to to just that application, but you know, the, the way the browser uh, keeps track of which applications can, can access those features is by uh, you know, origins, so the attacker script run, uh, scripts run in, in the vulnerable origin. Uh, and if there are any uh, uh, if there's any functionality like file downloads, so you, you're in your webmail application, you click on the attachment to download that. Um, 
you think you're downloading just an attachment that you got from someone, uh, but it's actually a, an attacker's executable. Uh, so you, you, can, uh, you can just open malicious file download uh, dialogs and, and the user might think it's, it's a trusted uh, bit of code from the application. And the same thing uh, with malicious plugins. Um, so the, the, the attacker can prevent you from using the application at all until you, uh, until you install the plugin of, of their choice. So, you know, given the choice of uh, installing the, the plugin that you, you don't really know is evil and, and just abandoning the web application, most people would, are probably inclined to, to just install it. Um, uh, and, and there are a, a few other things as well. So, for example, uh, uh, if there are any, so if you're in your webmail application and you, you get a link to CNN.com, uh, what the attacker can do is uh, open the, the CNN.com page in, uh, in another tab and inject its own uh, JavaScript into that page. So it, it, obviously, if, if there are no cross-site scripting bugs uh, on CNN, the attacker can't do it directly. But if there are any ads on, on CNN, the, attack, the attacker can navigate the frames. Uh, so um, the, the same origin policy has some exceptions for what kinds of uh, cross-origin uh, navigation can be done. And even if you can't access a page directly, you can navigate its uh, its frames uh, to see if there is a frame that you can control, at which point the attacker can uh, inject its code, uh, his code uh, into that frame. Um, so, and, and once you have all that, um, uh, once you have the long-term access to the, to the victim's browser, you can do, uh, so other than monitoring all the data uh, in the web application itself, uh, you can do other malicious JavaScript tricks. So uh, you have a lot of time to do history detection, scan local networks, uh, possibly attack uh, other web applications and uh, you know, distributed denial of service, uh, all of that. And, and it really doesn't, uh, it doesn't show up anywhere because the, the web application uh, you know, doesn't really see that there's anything wrong. You don't see that there's anything wrong. It's just injected code in, into the web app. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's not good, right? I mean, once you fall victim to that, it's, uh, all bets are off. Um, we're, we're sort of doomed. Um, but let, let's say that uh, you know, the, the resident XSS didn't really work. So you, you got to run cross-site scripting for, for a few seconds, then the user just closed the tab uh, altogether, uh, and, uh, you know, or, or you weren't able to, to, do, uh, to uh, achieve the resident XSS. Um, there are things you can do to maintain access to, uh, to the user's web application session regardless. So for example, you, you can backdoor uh, HTML5 local storage uh, uh, and, and uh, 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 various kinds of, of, of web databases. You can backdoor uh, flash cookies. Uh, so if, if the flash local shared object uh, data stores some kinds of configuration files or, or executable data, you can inject attacker code into there. So next time the user uh, loads up the web application legitimately, um, they will execute your code again. And, and if there are any cross-site scripting bugs based on cookies, you can, you can exploit that. Um, but there are, and there are also some new uh, mechanisms that are being developed uh, in HTML5 that, that make these kinds of attacks attacks easier. Um, so I, I don't mean to, uh, you know, f to bash HTML5 because it, in, in many ways it's, it's great and it's awesome, uh, but it, it, it gives uh, attackers the same features that it gives legitimate web developers. So it actually makes, it makes some things uh, easier, for, easier for attackers as well. Um, but even without all those you know, cool HTML5 tricks, uh, there are all these there are ways to keep the attacker code running in, in the uh, in the victim's browser. So. Uh, Opening up new windows uh, that will that won't be visible to the user uh, in the background that will keep uh, that will point to the victim's domain. So, for example, uh, you know you would have your uh, social network uh, tab. 
uh, and if you close that, the attacker can create the, uh, a pop on their window, uh, and before you manage to to close, to stop all the attacker's scripts, they can be injected back into that, that tiny window in the background. So even though you think you've closed all the tabs that point, uh, that might have attacker supplied code, you, you can have windows or frames in, on completely unrelated websites where this code was injected that still keeps running in, in the context of, of, of your domain. And the, the name for that you know, is, is frame hopping, where you, where you keep injecting this code wherever you can. So when the user closes one tab, you, the attacker uh, can look at all the other tabs that it has access to uh, and uh, either exploit cross-site scripting bugs in them, which is, which is much harder, uh, or, or just look for, for frames to, to add domains when, where everyone can inject their own code and, and survive this way. Um, so. After an attack like that executes, um, there, is, there is relatively little uh, that the web application itself can, can do to eliminate uh, the attacker's access to itself. Because if you keep uh, a tab open to, uh, you know, to your social network, uh, to a page from the social network's domain uh, uh, that had the cross-site scripting code, the, the, the evil code running, uh, it will always have access to, to other pages uh, within the same domain. So when you, you, you might log out of, of your social network in another tab, but whenever you log in again, that that evil tab has access to all your data again. So, and there is no way as the web application developer that you can close this tab in the user's browser. So it's been sort of permanently uh, scarred by, by, by the code uh, that the attacker chose. Um, uh, and it, it, can always, it always has access to, the, uh, to, this, to your web application session. Uh, and you, uh, you might think that uh, if you add some functionality so that uh, the, every page on your domain will uh, pull your server for some cleanup code that you might want to run, so every five minutes you will, you will get some JavaScript from the server and, and execute it, and if the code uh, sees that there is something wrong with, uh, with the page, it'll close it, just as sort of a, a, a precaution. That, that obviously doesn't work because uh, the attacker can always uh, just disable that code because uh, he is running uh, JavaScript on that page. Uh, and you can't really even tell the user that there is something wrong or that they should you know, close the browser and, and use a, a different browser profile or clean everything up because the attacker has control over everything that, that you might uh, send to the user in some cases. Um, so, uh, so, so you can't just say, you know, fix everything to the user because the attacker can intercept this message and just hide it. Um, so as the user, if, if you think you've, you've been attacked this way, um, uh, what can you do? So, so let's think of, of some things that, that might work. So first of all, what if we just close the tab with the web application? Well, that, that doesn't really help because there might be uh, other uh, tabs or, or other hidden frames that are still running the injected code. Um, uh, if, you, uh, if you first close all the tabs and then just close the browser completely so that there's no runtime uh, th that, is, that is maintained uh, across the, the browser closure, um, uh, th the problem is that uh, there you might have the client-side storage, the HTML5 local storage mechanism uh, or, or cache that has been uh, manipulated by the attacker. So next time you, you open up the browser, uh, even even if you have no tabs, the first time you navigate to the web application, it will get uh, rehacked uh, because of the, the poisoned uh, client-side storage. Um, and so you, you might think, okay, uh, let's let's clear all the local storage, then we'll restart the browser, and we'll, everything will be okay. But between the time that you clean up all the local storage and you close the browser, any tab that is open can uh, that is controlled by the attacker can actually re-poison all the the client-side storage because there there's a, a you know a, a small time delay between uh, clearing everything, uh, cleaning everything up, and, and closing the browser. So there, sorry. Wow. Okay. Um, 
So um, there is something that, that actually might let you clean up uh, your, your browser profile after, after you've been attacked this way. So you, know, you, you, keep, you close all windows, you close all tabs, you keep one tab open, you navigate it to a, a, a safe origin that, that no attacker scripts should have access to. You remove everything, you restart the browser, you hope that the vulnerability wa was fixed and that there are no uh, self XSS bugs that, that might have been exploited in the meantime by the attacker, but I mean, try explaining that to, to your mom or, or, or just a, a casual uh, you know, internet user. It, it's a really complex process. So uh, in a way, just throwing away the, the browser profile after you've been victim to cross-site scripting in one web application might, might be the easiest thing to do, which, which is sort of scary, right? Because think of all the data that you have in your browser profile. You have history, you have, uh, you know, you have cache and cookies and, and and all of that, and just to throw everything away because, because of, of one web application that was, uh, that was attacked, that, that, that sort of uh, it boggles the mind. Um, so, uh, you know, it, but, but unfortunately, I mean, that, that might be, that, that might be the, the most sensible thing to do. Um, so, j just to sort of recap and, and, and talk, and finally talk a little bit about, about rootkits. Um, so, th those are the analogies that I, that I came up with between the, the traditional uh, you know, client-side bugs uh, and, and web application bugs. So, uh, code execution or remote code execution is, is in a way, cross-site scripting is the analog to that. And the same way your exploit has to worry about uh, mitigations on the client side, you have to worry about uh, cross-site scripting filters or web application firewalls that might not allow uh, you to exploit the, the bug that you want to exploit. And for maintaining access, uh, the, the poison local storage or frame hopping are, are techniques that you can use in, uh, in web browsers. And one thing that is, that is quite interesting that, that I haven't really talked about is for, for most malware, um, you, you have some uh, command and control channel to the, uh, back to the attacker. Um, and obviously, in the web application, you can just keep uh, loading a script from the attacker's domain uh, and get commands this way. But there are so many stealthy ways to uh, to sneak in code that that would that would look completely uh, innocuous to to someone just running a sniffer. So you could you could have DNS-based covert channels. You can have uh, there, there's this thing in HTML5 called web workers. You can create a, a, an invisible window in a way or invisible JavaScript execution context that will keep uh, asking the attacker's server for. Um, uh, f for uh, a JavaScript file to execute uh, that you will never see in Firebug or uh, in your uh, web inspector in Chrome uh, and communicate uh, with the infected page with, with post message. There are, there are a whole uh, numbers of ways of, uh, of, of doing that. And, and the malicious payloads, uh, you know, similar to, to the client side, just uh, running a keylogger uh, or, uh, you know, or doing uh, denial of service attacks. Uh, in web applications, you can also compromise the data in the web application, try and uh, elevate access to other applications, uh, and, and do the, uh, the usual uh, malicious JavaScript um, uh, tricks that, that I talked about. Um, so this is uh, almost the end. So, so the thing I want to uh, leave you with today uh, is uh, there, there are two thoughts, basically. So the first one is that after uh, you have been, you or, or your users have been victim to uh, a cross-site scripting or a script injection attack, it's, it's really, really hard to reliably clean this up and to make sure that any future interactions of the user with, with your web application will be in, will have integrity in, in any sense of the word, because you can always have attacker supplied scripts hiding somewhere in the browser that you're just not aware of and you can't get rid of. Uh, 
And the second thing is, uh, and it's something that, that we haven't seen yet, but uh, you know, maybe, uh, and, and it, I would be very happy if we didn't see it at all, um, but uh, the, the sort of attacks that, that are uh, uh, enabled by the resident cross-site scripting class of bugs are, are quite nasty um, because, of, of, because of all the assumptions that they violate in, in users' minds. So you just don't realize that the application you're, you're using might do all the things to, to harm you. So, you know, snooping on you, uh, phishing you, and, and, and just act against your interest because you, we're not really used to that, right? For, on the client side, if you have uh, injected code, it, it, it doesn't really inject itself into existing applications most of the time. So you ha if you have a backdoored version of, of Microsoft Office, it doesn't really intercept your click on the file menu because why would it? And things like that are possible and, and are actually remarkably easy to do with, with JavaScript uh, uh, in, in web browsers. Um, so, uh, I, I just want to uh, thank uh, two of my colleagues who, who really helped uh, flesh out the, the ideas that, that I talked about today. Um, Michal Zalewski is, uh, uh, is, a, is a great uh, web security guy and, and security guy in general. Uh, he recently wrote a, a book called The, the Tangled Web. Uh, and if you, if you have any interest in web security, this is uh, the book to read. Um, so I, I strongly encourage you to read it. Um, just a word of caution, if you search for it on Amazon, uh, there are some other books by the same title. His one doesn't have the naked guy on the cover. Uh, <laughs> So, so just search for, for that one. Uh, and Eduardo Velanava is, is another one of my colleagues who is amazing at all client-side things, and, and he helped me out a lot as well. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arthur, for that great talk. Uh, let me just reiterate what I said at the beginning. <laughs> if you would, we, we're going to have a Q&A session now, so if you would be so kind to maybe stay seated and quiet until we're done so everyone can enjoy it and uh, take all your trash with you when you leave later and leave via the front door. But let's uh, start with some questions. Okay. Well. Right, let's just wait half a minute for the impatient. <laughs> okay, um, let's start with a question from the front row. Um, so I noticed you haven't actually covered anything about like attacking browser or plugins or like, uh, sorry, add-ons mm -hmm. or like um, stuff like that because like there's been hilarious bugs and stuff like TweetDeck and whatever else and like in Chrome, um, so some, there's like uh, permissions so they're somewhat restricted, but like obviously because they are going to use local storage, I mean, wouldn't that be a better target? I'm just surprised you didn't cover anything on them. Um, so this is actually a very good point. Um, so most of the, uh, the plugins that, uh, or, or the add-ons that use local storage do it in the context of the, uh, in, in the origin of their uh, sort of web application, right? So you have, uh, or, or often they, they trust that data. So by, by uh, running cross-site scripting in the, in the context of, of that origin, you can actually elevate privileges because the, uh, the add-on will, will treat that data as trusted because why wouldn't it? It's their domain. Um, uh, and, and yes, so it, it, would, it would give you privilege escalation because you would uh, execute in the context of the, uh, of the add-on rather than just just a random web app. Yeah, thanks. Right. Further questions? Yeah. Uh, do you have any knowledge about uh, known exploits of this concept in Wild? Um, not really. Um, so, so I believe right now it's actually easier to get users to run uh, malicious executables in many ways, unfortunately. So, you know, there, there are so many easier things to do than, than doing all the work to backdoor someone's uh, you know, web application session if you can just get them to, to double click on an exe. Um, but uh, I, I do think. 
I, I'm a little afraid that, that something like this uh, will come to the web world once the sort of low-hanging fruit attacks uh, are harder than they are right now. So just the question is, uh, you know, will they ever get uh, uh, difficult enough that it'll be worthwhile for attackers to, to use these techniques? Um, hi. Hi. Hello. I have, I have two questions for just for understanding um, this better. Uh, the first is um, if I'm so I'm I have the scenario now. I go to a website. I get this malicious code somewhere in my local storage. I close my browser. It's there in the local storage. Now the website detects the uh, malicious code, removes the malicious code, and now I go back to the website. So what is the help in the local storage? I mean, it's not evolved the local storage. What does the attacker get from my local storage when it's still there? Um, so, so the main uh, the main problem is that the web that a lot of web applications trust the data in local storage, right? So they. Uh, they just uh, eval uh, a JavaScript resource that, that's in there. So once, uh, once the web application cleans it okay, up... Okay, so you mean the local storage is evolved sometimes from the website by, by intention? Yes. So, okay. so, th so this is so we can treat it as a as a bug. And uh, the paper I mentioned, the, the Emperor's New APIs, um, they were actually uh, they got in touch with a lot of web application providers, telling them, you know, you, you sh maybe you shouldn't be trusting the data in local storage because it it can have negative consequences. For example, secondary cross-site scripting. Um, okay. Okay. So then everything is uh, mm -hmm. clear. I, okay. I've, didn't know the fact that websites really aware eval the local so, storage. So it so. doesn't have to be evaled, right? So there are many so, other but, ways. But otherwise, so you gain no advantage, I think. So, so well, th there are other ways in which they trust the data that doesn't have to uh, resort to eval. For example, if you use it in an inner HTML assignment, if you store some snippets of sanitized HTML, as, uh, you, know, you sanitize it on the server side, your application okay, yeah. puts it in local storage, then you trust it. Then when you, when you use it again, the attacker uh, code can can be injected. Okay. 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 Right. Uh, we then have a question from the interwebs. <laughs> Hello. Um, one question from Brussels. Uh, he asks, "What can a sys admin do to prepare for this?" That's that's a tough one. Um, so I hate to say nothing, uh, but but really uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so I actually, so, so my my main worry is that there's relatively little that web applications themselves can can do about it, right? So even at, at that level, um, I mean, there, for just the local storage attacks, you can make sure you you never trust anything uh, in local storage, or uh, you can uh, you know you can have signatures on on any data that you want to eval or, or something like that, um, but for for sysadmins, I don't really see any mitigations. Okay, another one? Another one? Um, quick question. What about the privacy modes of web browsers? Do they mitigate the problem of recovering from a once it has been infected? Yes, yes. So th this is a very good point th that I didn't mention. So if you run in uh, in private browsing mode uh, for for pretty much all your your web navigation, uh, this will this will help, right? Because there will be no. Uh, so once you close it, uh, all the local storage data gets wiped out. The execution contexts of of all the code that might be running in, in hidden uh, windows or or tabs or, or hidden frames uh, will all also get wiped out. So the, the only problem I see with that is, is if Flash doesn't play well. Uh, and I know historically there, there are some incompatibilities between uh, Flash shared objects and, and bri browser's private modes. Um, you, you could put potentially uh, inject some, some uh, data into Flash cookies that, uh, that would persist after you quit the private browsing mode. But, but yes, this is a, a good mitigation. Uh, but then you sort of, uh, so I actually think it's a, a very good solution. But uh, when you do that, you lose on some of the benefits of using a modern browser. You don't have any history, any, any saved data. But, but might be a, a worthwhile trade-off. 
uh, wouldn't it be possible to, to use some kind of hashing like Git does uh, for the local storage? Maybe an external program to check it up when the, when the, before the browser starts or anything like this? So you could, so if, uh, as a web application, uh, if, you, if you intend to uh, eval uh, a, a blob of JavaScript uh, when, you, when you load, when, when you start your application, you can definitely, uh, uh, you, you can have a signature-based system to verify the integrity of that. The problem is that you can't really store the signature anywhere on the client side because, uh, be, because that can be tampered with. Um, but uh, if, if, you, uh, you know, if you always get the, the signature from the server, uh, you run some kind of, you know, you run the RSA on it, uh, you verify that, that the local storage is, uh, is, is correct, uh, and, and then you load it. It might have some problems, for example, if, if between the time you, you run the check and the time you actually load it, uh, if, if it has been tampered with, then you would still, you know, there, there are uh, race conditions there. Uh, but, but in general, it's, it's probably, uh, if, if you use a local storage cache, uh, which, is, which is actually a, a recommended solution for uh, mobile apps. So we have uh, a lot of the people in the performance, uh, web performance community pushing for, for using the, uh, the client side storage mechanisms as cache for uh, CSS and, and JavaScript and, and other kinds of resources. Um, so I actually think some kind of signature system would be uh, a good way to make sure that you can use this mechanism safely. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, there's time for one or two more. No further questions? All right. Uh, then let's thank Arthur again for the great talk. <laughs>